the workers were replacing all the doors at the Hotel Sampo. They felt honored to be working in the official residence of the French royal court. Everyone was silent while on the territory of the royal family, but later in the evening they discussed what they saw going on. It was rather clear to the common people, the aristocrats are mad with fat. Queen Isabeau of Bavaria and her daughter-in-law Valencia Visconti, Duchess of Orleans, were especially criticized. It was because of them in particular that the doors in the whole building had to be changed. The ladies, as it were, could not fit through them. And no, not because these women had grown fat from their royal feasts. They made hair so frilly and wide that it didn't fit through the old-sized doorways. They had simply gone crazy with their luxury. Such behavior must have indeed been dictated by madness, but not their own, rather that of King Charles VI. His faithful wife, Isabeau, created a festive atmosphere in every possible way. She dressed up in extravagant chic outfits and wore strange hairstyles. As a result, the entertainment of Charles the Mad turned into a terrible sight, worthy of a scene in Game of Thrones. In history, this has come to be known as the Bal des Ordants, and the king's brother, Louis I, Duke of Orleans, was to blame for everything. Now let's take a look at it all in order. The year is 1380. The King of France, Charles V the Wise, is dead. Long live King Charles VI. But the boy was then all but 11 years old, and so good relatives came to assist him. The regency was divided between the young monarch's four uncles. Somehow the running country's government did not work out for them. Uncle Louis of Bourbon and John of Berry did hardly anything sensible. It is even believed that they were bribed. It was as if someone had said, I give you money and you throw the country in the trash. What a great deal. Uncle Louis of Anjou went on an eternal journey to Italy, taking with him the entire French treasury. Only Philip of Burgundy remained to help the young Charles VI. He was one of the most prominent nobles in Europe, so not a bad option. And now let's look at all this through the eyes of an 11-year-old boy. First off, his father has died, transferring responsibility for the country and its people to him. Do you remember yourself at that age? At this point, one is just learning to manage at least one's own room. Then the relatives who should have helped, who should have been relied upon, suddenly turned out to be traitors. And in addition to all this were unlimited opportunities, a lot of money, and a chic, aristocratic life. And so the character of the young king was formed, more or less. Nevertheless, at the age of 20, Charles VI assumed his full rule. He immediately showed himself to be a reasonable ruler who cared about people. His uncle regent Philip of Burgundy had a different policy which is why the young king received the nickname, the Beloved. First of all, Charles VI relieved his uncles of their duties to lead the country and then resumed the practice of his father, reinstating the Marmosets. This is a group of court advisors who were often not princes or civil servants, but were good politicians and were especially loyal. Having established order in domestic affairs together with advisors, Charles the Beloved set about to develop foreign policy. He secured the Truce of Lullingham, a three-year peace with England, Back then, in the context of a protracted war, this was an extremely important step. Next, the new government lowered taxes. The people liked it, but not the aristocrats. One who was particularly upset was the Duke of Berry, who was stripped of his governorship in the Languedoc region due to excessive taxation. Furthermore, the king's team began work on centralization of power. And, according to the classic nature of the genre, just when everything started to improve, something went wrong. In this case, it was the king's head. John IV, Duke of Brittany, organized an assassination attempt on the head of the Marmosets, Olivier de Clisson. Naturally, the attack on the king's chief advisor and the constable of France was outrageous, but Charles took it as a direct attempt on the crown. He gathered the best knights and went to Brittany to take revenge. No one questioned the fact that Duke John was a scoundrel, but the king's reaction still seemed excessive to many. Very soon it became clear that he was really and truly out of his mind. On the way to Brittany, Charles VI, for no apparent reason, rushed with a sword at his people. With the cry, forward against the traitors, they wish to deliver me to the enemy. He killed four. The king was stopped, after which he fell into a coma. At this point, the traitors returned to the scene. Considering that Charles would not come to his senses, they seized power and sent the Marmoset advisors home. All of this they did very quickly, given that the king woke up after only four days. He quickly returned to Paris to take control of everything, but after this incident, he was no longer able to clean up even his own headspace. The king claimed that his body was made of fragile glass. Still, that didn't exactly stop him from howling like a wolf and showing other signs of insanity. The nobles believed that Charles was a victim of witchcraft. The less diehard thought that the Lord was punishing him. Chroniclers at the French court wrote that the king's condition was so bad that it was impossible to hide it. Thus, he got the nickname Mad. 
Modern researchers claim that Charles VI suffered from paranoid schizophrenia. One of the best doctors in all of France, Guillaume de Harsigny, attempted to treat him. At that time, the doctor was already 92 years old. Doc tried every known drug and technique on the Mad King. As a result, he refused to continue treatment and decided that the patient must be protected from work and stress. No government, only entertainment. And so Charles kept on tripping. During one of his attacks, he did not even recognize his own wife and ordered her to be expelled. But when the disease receded a little, the king transferred custody of his son, the future King Charles VII, and organized Isabeau a place in the Council of Regents in case of a relapse. As a result, the Queen Regent received significant political power, which was not typical for medieval Europe. Afterwards, Charles, although he remained king, had practically nothing to do with ruling the country. Instead, entertainment events and all kinds of displays were arranged for him. Because of this, Isabeau and Valentina Visconti dressed up extravagantly, and for the same reason a party was organized, which turned into the Bal des Ordens. On January 28, 1393, the Queen gave a masquerade ball. The reason was the third marriage of her lady-in-waiting. It's not surprising that Isabeau was openly accused of squandering and reproached for unhealthy eccentricity. In the Middle Ages, there was a tradition called charivari, a funny and mocking custom of celebrating the second and subsequent marriages of widowers. The main part consisted of a crowd making noise with pots, pans, or whatever just so happened to be handy. Usually the crowd came at night under the windows of the newlyweds. This was how the community showed its disapproval of violating community norms, as well as remarriages. A union between people with too big a difference in age also fell into this category. It is believed that Queen Isabeau organized just such a stupid party. Local nobleman, Eugette de Gasset, came up with a crazy idea for her. The man himself was, at court, called the most cruel and arrogant of people. He was truly known as such. For example, de Gasset is known to have made servants bark like dogs. It was he who proposed to dress up several nobles like wild men. These are folklore characters of the Middle Ages, similar to fauns or satyrs. They are covered with wool and absolutely wild by nature. Therefore, six aristocrats in hairy suits with the same masks on their faces howled and ran on all fours in front of the nobility. The task of the audience was to guess who was in front of them. It would seem that this is a strange but safe entertainment for the rich French. Still, there was one important detail in the performance. It was forbidden to light candles or torches in the hall because the outfits of wild people were created from resin, fabric, and hemp fibers. What could possibly go wrong here? The bodies of the six participants in the wild dance were covered with a cloth soaked with resin. Then, with the help of wax and the same resin, vegetable fibers resembling wool were glued on top. Their faces were also disguised, and thus they turned out to be real savages. The aristocrats stepped fully into their role and began to create wild obscenities. One participant of the show clung to the 15-year-old duchess, Joan de Berry. At that moment, two drunken men burst into the hall, already very late to the party. Among them was the king's brother, Louis I, Duke of Orleans, and both held torches. Immediately upon entering the hall, the men approached the dancers, and Louis brought the torch to the face of one of the savages to see the dancer. Most chronicles claim that a single spark fell on the foot of the wild man. Nevertheless, researchers have also found information stating that the Duke of Orleans threw the torch. Panic instantly ensued and all six dancers caught fire along with several spectators. This incident might not have gone down in history, only among the wild people just so happened to be none other than the king himself. Isabeau, who knew this already, passed out when the men caught fire. It seems that 15-year-old Joan de Berry turned out to be the most sane at the ball. The Duchess recognized the king and the dancer who had aggravated her. When the fire broke out, she instantly threw the train of her dress on the monarch, and this saved his life. Another wild man, Sieur de Nantoulet, jumped into either a vat of water or a barrel of wine. In any case, he sat in the liquid until the flame went out. Others were less fortunate. Count de Joigny burned to death on the spot. Earl heirs Vain de Foix and Amory Potiers died two days later from their burns. Huguette de Gizet, who gave way to the story of the masquerade, lived for three days. The records say that he cursed everyone in a row until his death. The ball was the last straw. The common people were furious because of the aristocrats' debauchery and extravagance. They threatened them with an uprising. After that, the entire court, led by the king, walked through Paris in a procession of humility and apology. Louis I, whom everyone blamed for the incident, provided a large donation for the construction of a chapel in the Celestine Monastery of Paris. This calmed the people a little, but the already lousy reputation of the Duke of Orleans was completely ruined. After the Ball des Ardennes, 
Charles VI became even more insane, but he officially remained king until his death in 1422. Isabeau did not enjoy any special respect among the French. Everyone knew that she liked neither the court nor the people. Additionally, there were rumors that she was mistress to the king's brother. The dynasty began to fall apart, and Charles the Mad began to be forgotten. In 1407, John the Fearless tried to obtain the throne by killing the Duke of Orleans. This led to the beginning of the Armagnac Burgundian Civil War. As a result, the French court became associated with irresponsibility, weak morals, and decadence for as many as 200 years. What are your thoughts on the story? Share them in the comments and don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel.